Alliance presentation. I will now um, start letting people in. Um, so here we go. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, Ian. Good morning, Jonathan. Good morning, Kevin. Good morning. Good morning, Keith. Good morning, Simon. Good morning, morning, morning. Uh, if you have joined, um, happy Easter, everybody. I hope you ate lots of chocolate. Um, if you could go on mute, that would be great, just to cut out any background noise. That would be wonderful. Um, so I hope the Easter bunny was kind to everybody. Let's just, oh, let's just add a few more into the lobby. So hopefully we can let uh, Keith have the mic, as they say. So there we go. A few others joining. Morning, Philip. Morning, Peter. Morning, Stuart. Morning, Simon. Uh, morning, Steph. Uh, if you've just joined, if you could uh, go on mute, that would be great. Um, just to uh, give the mic to, uh, to Keith, that would be fantastic. Um, just a few. We'll leave it another minute or two. Morning, Margaret. Morning, Margaret. Uh, good morning, Mark. More people joining. Morning, Sam. Morning, Michael. If you could just go on mute, that would be great. Just to um, cut out any uh, background noise, that would be great. Thanks, Peter, for doing that. Um, perfect. OK, uh, perfect. OK, well, um, I'll monitor the lobby there, Keith, but um, good morning, everybody. Welcome to this week's uh, Coffee Morning with Paint and Playpen. We are delighted to uh, bring to you the Consumer Duty Alliance. Um, and some of you will know Keith Richards and some of you won't. Um, he's left his guitar behind, sadly. So, um, um, <laughs> Ian, I got you laughing on that one, didn't I? <laughs> So, um, yeah, yeah, it's a terrible um, but old joke, that is. It's a terrible but old joke. He's left his guitar behind. What a shame, but there we go. But he's very good at the spoons. Um, no, anyway, moving on. Um, so, um, yeah, as usual, we're being recorded. So everybody thumbs up, Ian, Stuart, everybody thumbs up. Henry, yep, yeah, good. We're being recorded. And um, if you'd like to ask a question, please raise a hand. Um, we'll op also open up the chat room uh, if you want to uh, make any comments. Uh, but as you know, Henry and I prefer people to ask questions and interact. So without any further ado, I will pass over to Keith and um, uh, we look forward to your presentation, Keith. So thanks very much indeed for your time this morning. No, great. Thank you very much, Steve. And uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, sincere apologies for those who don't know me and was genuinely expecting the ageing rock star to, uh, to turn up this morning. Uh, I, I appreciate how disappointing that, that must be. But um, uh, the uh, the old ones are are the best, and uh, but I can't tell you how much. Uh, no matter where I speak, everyone tends to refer to the uh, uh, my Rolling Stone more famous namesake. So um, uh, it's always a good good icebreaker. Uh, anyway, I'd like to um, uh, thank you very much, Steve, for the opportunity to uh, to just introduce you to the Consumer Duty Alliance, what that really means, uh, why it's been established and the role that hopefully everyone can play across the sector. Um, before I do that, the, the Consumer Duty Alliance really is, is, of course, aligned to the next big regulatory change. For those of you who've been around in, in the sector for as long as me, you'll have seen, um, you'll have been around in the sector before regulation uh, was introduced and seen the, uh, the major reforms that um, have been uh, implemented to influence change across the market for the greater good of the, of the consumer. Now, I came from a time before regulation when my organisation or the organisation I was employed by passionately believed that it put the customer at the heart of everything that it did. And in fact, I've got to say from first-hand experience, it felt like that. Um, so why have we named this the Consumer Duty Alliance? Well, actually, unlike any other regulatory uh, change or reform that we've seen so far, whether it's polarisation, depolarisation, uh, RDR, they're regulatory terms that probably have very little meaning to consumers, but have had a profound impact on shaping the retail uh, investment markets or retail consumer markets. Um, Consumer Duty Alliance is really what we were about before regulation came into place. So one of the reasons that uh, it struck us to create a Consumer Duty Alliance uh, is because it's what we were all about. 
Um, now, whether or not we do that to a great degree or not, uh, that's exactly what we're about. So um, some people have asked already, isn't Consumer Duty Alliance just a limited time span uh, up to the 31st of July? And of course, for those of you that, that are very active uh, in, uh, in the requirements of Consumer Duty, you will know that 31st of July is just literally the start. From our perspective, um, we started uh, uh, the Financial Vulnerability Task Force back in 2021. It was a not-for-profit consumer uh, interest company, uh, and it was designed to share good practice across the market to help individuals and firms better implement the regulatory requirements against vulnerability. Now, we took a very different approach because many advisors across the markets didn't necessarily consider that they deal with too many vulnerable customers. The point that they're missing in regulation is that we all actually have vulnerabilities that need to be taken into consideration. Very often they're temporary um, rather than permanent. So where people were stigmatizing or stereotyping vulnerability is for those uh, at a certain age or with age related uh, cognitive impairments or, or identifiable disability, frankly, most of the challenges that we've had uh, through the years with regulation is because we've not identified vulnerable circumstances that consumers are placed in and deal with them accordingly. So that's really wh where that came from. Uh, and it was based around a consumer guide. So after all, if consumers don't get to understand what good advice should look like, uh, they won't know. Uh, and certainly they won't be able to challenge accordingly. Uh, and importantly, for the firms that adopted, over 4,000 advisors adopted the Financial Vulnerability Charter, which really allows them to introduce the way that they deal with vulnerable circumstances and the services they provide to their clients. So the, the Financial Vulnerability Task Force wasn't about augmenting or uh, positioning a body or an organisation. It was actually about supporting the market to improve standards that led to better consumer outcomes and allowed adopters to really augment what they did uh, in addressing those consumer needs. And there's a whole host of good practice guides. Some of them uh, you might be familiar with, theft and fraud within families, for example, uh, a key issue for government uh, and regulators and indeed the sector. Uh, and this was launched in uh, association with the All-Party Parliamentary Group for Insurance and Financial Services. Uh, there's a host of other good practice guides that are available. Uh, including um, sudden wealth and, of course, the impact of vulnerability through divorce. Um, that sort of takes us on to uh, why establish a consumer duty alliance? Well, it is an evolution of the Financial Vulnerability Task Force. It's a natural evolution as, of course, vulnerability now gets wrapped within the much broader rules of consumer duty. Um, and it's interesting when regulators make statements along the lines of our new duty sets higher and clearer standards of consumer protection across financial services and requires firms to put their customers' needs first. Now, for many intermediaries, bearing in mind there's five and a half thousand regulated advice firms, 80% of which are deemed to be small, categorised to be small, that's five people or, or less. Um, that can be quite a daunting statement as if firms haven't been putting the needs of their customers first. Uh, and often what we find is that there is a level of frustration around regulation that needs to be simplified. So the sharing of good practice is one way in which firms can better start to benchmark against standards across the market, uh, help to better make sure that they're, under, they're understanding their interpretation of regulation and make sure that they, they address it accordingly. The Consumer Duty Alliance is an independent, uh, not-for-profit community interest company with no commercial activities or services. Now, it's a really important part here. In my experience, I've been involved in many boards, uh, many groups where like-minded individuals come together, even in competitive markets, very happy to share good practice and experience, almost certainly as, as you do through Playpen, uh, but it's very difficult to uh, pull all that together and galvanise it under one body without one, organizers, uh, one organization starting to lose its own identity. So the reason that we've created Consumer Duty Alliance is it's an alliance across the sector 
which actually means it's an alliance about the people and the firms in the sector, not a single body. So to be a member of the alliance actually really further augments individuality, uh, the role of competition in the market to work better to protect the interests and serve the needs of consumers. So it isn't about a single body that takes credit. And I'll just explain that a bit more really with my past experience at the Personal Finance Society and something we run as a cross-sector group back then. It's a dedicated body for the personal finance profession, by the profession, but you'll not be surprised that many of the affiliates that are already joining the Alliance actually come from without the personal, come outside of the personal finance sector and are much broader across retail financial services. Um, it's an alliance of sharing good practice, as I've already mentioned, and it provides a directory of established support and services available across the market. So this is where it's important that an alliance doesn't compete with its members or affiliates, um, that basically it helps to pull it all together as a more united profession. Uh, the Consumer Duty Alliance is there to inspire and justify public confidence and trust in our members and the wider personal finance profession. One of the things that uh, I think we've all experienced over the many, many years is that um, we are a relatively fragmented and disparate sector. Uh, interestingly enough, insurance is far more joined up, um, arguably so is the investment management uh, sector far more joined up, but the intermediary sector has often been quite fragmented, not least because of the dynamics. It is five and a half thousand individual firms, the majority of which are relatively small. Um, we're never going to inspire public confidence and trust, and neither are we going to inspire the trust of, of policymakers unless we also change the culture within the broader sector. So the whole idea of, of bringing together an alliance is to allow sectors to respect that there needs to be different, there needs to be um, different propositions, different methods, different support programmes, uh, and different isn't bad. It's just different and it's needed, uh, but we're all part of the same joined up profession. The, uh, there's three types of membership, um, or sorry, two types of membership. One is uh, individual members, of which we're now up to probably about 7,000 advisors uh, in total. Uh, associate is really for the advice firm uh, who becomes an associate of the consumer duty. Affiliates are very different. They're normally commercial businesses, support service uh, companies. So, for example, 360 compliance services, Simply Biz, um, LNG, uh, to name but a few, who have their own individual brand identity, wouldn't want to lose that by becoming a member of another body. But actually, by becoming an affiliate, uh, they commit to share good practice across the market, which actually augments the position they play in supporting good consumer outcomes uh, across the sector. So affiliate really allows bigger brands to come along, uh, be part of an alliance, uh, a cross-sector alliance, without losing their own individuality or it crossing uh, their own brand values or identity. So it's a very important part for us to create a platform that allowed big brands that are possibly better and already leaders in the market in certain aspects to join the, the um, and become part of the alliance without losing their own identity. Um, sorry, just bear with me. Uh, there is also, um, so the, the, the Consumer Duty Alliance is a pro bono programme. So the very, really important part about bringing together something that's non-commercial means that it's easier for others to join. There's no conflicts of interest to get in the way. Uh, so the board are all pro bono or volunteer. Uh, we've got uh, a growing board of um, key, key players that gives us a diversity across the market. Um, We've got a financial planning forum that's now chaired by Nick Can. For any of you know, Nick Can was the uh, the, the um, CEO of the Institute of Financial Planning for many years and a leader in setting standards for financial planning. The Consumer Duty Champions Forum has been supported and set up with the help of Johnny Timpson, who many of you will know, and the Technology Forum is now being led and chaired by Ian McKenna. Um, we have decided to retain the Financial Vulnerability Task Force within the umbrella of the Consumer 
Duty Alliance, mainly because there's an awful lot more work to be done more specifically around vulnerability and vulnerable circumstances. Uh, again, just to, to share um, a quick screenshot, there's already uh, a guide has gone out from the consumer duty around consumer duty and retirement income. Uh, this was a really key aspect for us, not least because uh, it's going to be a key focus of thematic review by, um, by the FCA post the implementation of the new rules. Um, now, on to something that's uh, probably a bit of a first, and uh, uh, here at Playpen, uh, you're the first to, uh, to know that we're in the early stages of reforming the Pensions Advice Task Force. Um, so for those of you who are aware, uh, we created a task force, uh, cross-sector task force, which included uh, some people that were already on this, this call, um, including Margaret, uh, Steve Webb, we had the uh, PensionWise, TPAS and MAS as they were at that time, uh, only just coming under the umbrella of MAPS. Um, and we have PI insurers and, and obviously representatives from across the sector. Um, the idea was to create an industry-wide representative body whose ultimate purpose was to raise advice standards and enhance consumer protection in complex areas of, of pension advice. The early stage, of course, was was focused around DB pension transfers, which uh, was receiving a huge amount of focus at the time. Um, and of course, some key people on this this call will be very aware of some of the issues that then subsequently came to light through um, the British Steel fiasco. Um, we did create a gold standard. The idea of the gold standard wasn't actually about the advisor or the advice firm, it was a gold standard for consumers to be able to rely on. So it was fundamentally built around a consumer guide, uh, straightforward guidance to empower the consumer to make better informed decisions, but also drive the standards of those that were adopters of the, uh, the code of professional ethics around the pension transfer gold standard. So um, we have decided that um, uh, it's one of the missing links from the consumer duty. Um, I think, Margaret, I'm sorry to put you in the uh, in the part, but Margaret Snowden has agreed to chair the, the, the new newly formed Pensions Advice Task Force. So it's been dormant for a couple of years. And logically, we can see uh, the sense that it now forms part of the Consumer Duty Alliance uh, to really reinstate it and move it on to the, the, the second phase which was always originally planned, uh, especially given the, the uh, some of the challenges and opportunities that we've got ahead. So um, that was a bit of a whirlwind, but I, I uh, respect that uh, you didn't want to, to listen to me rattling on for, for too long and death by PowerPoint. Uh, so um, uh, in the tradition of um, pension playpen, as I understand, uh, we're now going to go to uh, some Q&A. Thanks very much, Keith. That was um, very, uh, very interesting and uh, <laughs> delivering good outcomes for everybody. And uh, it's, it's across the industry, isn't it, Keith? This is the important thing. Um, you know, it's uh, it's so important to uh, get buy in from lots and lots of different um, factions and um, parts of the industry. So it's a uh, it's very, very good. And Margaret, you sort of unmuted then. Did you want to say anything about being the new chairperson of <laughs> I know Keith put you on the spot, but <laughs> yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry, I couldn't um I couldn't actually get my phone out of my pocket quickly enough um as I'm um, being Bob the Builder today, um rather than working. But um but you know I'm I'm very pleased um to do this because um the the the, the advice task force was brilliant um because it did um pull out you know the key factors that I'm sure that an advisor was ethical um, and went beyond the FCA um, regulation. So, um, so I thought it was great. Um, the shame it sort of dwindled, but um, was so delighted when um, you know Keith was um, was willing to resurrect it under his um, under his new um, banner. So, so I'm very pleased um, to start again um, driving advisor standards up. Um, and, and particularly looking at advice in the workplace to try and make sure that um, you know there's a there's a consistent standard 
and it's really focused on member outcomes. Um, so that's like a bit of a plug for it. Um, and uh, back to you guys. OK, thank you. Uh, Henry, you got your hand up as well. Uh, and then we'll probably come on to Simon as a practitioner. I think Simon might want to say a few words as well. But uh, Henry, you go first. Go on. Yeah, um, and like many people on this call, I'm subject to the consumer duty uh, and so I've spent quite some time this uh, this last three months reading through. Uh, I'm conscious when I read it that actually, although most people seem to think this is about PI and limiting liability and, and the kind of the things which might happen to your business if you don't get the consumer duty right, actually most of what the FCA are actually writing about is the positive aspects uh, to members and indeed to the financial services industry of, of getting consumer duty into our DNA. So I, I guess I, I, my comment would really be that most of the consumer duty stuff, which I like, is about getting people better value for money. Um, and to what extent do you feel, Keith, from your soundings that people are sort of looking at the positive? And to what extent are we still stuck in the, oh my goodness, we've got to avoid another BSPS or another fiasco with Arch Crew or whatever it might be? Yeah, it's it's a really good question, um, Henry, because I think as we all know, a lot of people generally see regulation as a, as a burden uh, and a challenge, uh, not least because there's aspects of new rules that, that require each firm to uh, make their own interpretation of whether or not they, they comply. I think in answer that generally, most I think see it in a similar way. They see it as an opportunity to, to just check uh, that they are meeting the requirements of consumer duty. Many, many believe they already do, but the important thing is they don't often know how to just test against the new rules. And, and of course, headlines often you know, are de designed to create interest to read them, but often they, they can over-dramatise what's being required. So we do need to simplify, I think, some guidance around how firms uh, that are already meeting standards or the approach they're taking and then share that good practice across the market to allow others to, I think, have a bit more confidence around the fact that they're probably a lot closer than they, they may realise, but there are some key things they need to do to test that they are indeed doing what they think they're doing. Thanks. OK, good answer. Uh, Margaret, you got your hand raised and then we'll come to Billy, if that's all right, Billy. So ladies first. <laughs> oh, thanks. I, did, I, did, I, did, I was happy to wait in the queue, um, but I, I just thought I'd um, point out I, um, I, did a, I did an article a, a few months ago now on um, and I mentioned consumer duty. Um, and, and that was because um, I mentioned in a group of trustees um, how about, you know, taking consumer duty um, and bringing it into trust world? Um, and I was astonished at the number of people who said it's nothing to do with us. Um, we've got, you know, treating members fairly. And, you know, consumer duty is really for all of those um, sort of retail, um, you know, sellers. Um, and I thought, I think that's wrong, but um, I would be interested in, in the view around the table. Keith, what do you think about that? Well, I definitely think that I agree with you, Margaret. I think that's definitely wrong. I mean, it's interesting. The one thing that um, captured our, our thought process when we were looking to establish the Consumer Duty Alliance was, is, was it a temporary? I mean, a few people have made reference to the fact that is, is it just a temporary thing? But, but interestingly enough, consumer duty applies to every single uh, organisation. So, um, you know, if, you, if you're so frankly, I, I think there's a lot more education that needs to be done, uh, which is why the role of, of for example, consumer champions um, is such a key and vital role to uh, to actually uh, not just support boards, but also to uh, to challenge their thought process. But yeah, open up to what others think. OK, great. Thank you. Uh, Billy, do you want to make a statement, ask a question? Here is Solo. Uh, oh, hello. Um, no, I was going to ask um, a, a question. So f first of all, Keith, I've been meaning to sign up, so this is the prompt for me to do so. Um, I, I, no, there's, 
um, consumer duty is something that um, it, it sort of runs through my vein. And as Ross Altman once said to me, you know, we've got the skulls on our back um, <laughs> demonstrating our commitment. But are you going to reach out to um, the, the end consumer or is this just going to be contained, um, you know, sort of basically within, you know, the IFA community? In, in my experience, you know, the, the, these things are great. But of course, you know, how do you end up, you know, practicing what you preach? Yeah, it's thanks, Billy, and uh, and good to see you. Um, we we do intend to extend it across. In fact, we've already had insurance companies that want to sign up. We've had investment management companies who want to to sign up, and in fact, we've had a couple of trade associations. Um, so so that the whole idea of of the uh, so first of all, for everyone else, um, what I should have mentioned is signing up is free. Uh, from a member's point of view, it's a commitment to a code of professional standards, but there is a badge. That then can be displayed as a member and the same for affiliates. Affiliates are not expected to sign up to a code, they are, are expected to be larger firms that provide support or direct to consumer. We have already created a consumer guide, uh, Billy, in answer to your question and ultimately what we'd like to do is our, our ultimate vision is that um, if we start to actually demonstrate um, an alliance of sharing good practice, a willingness, which is what many people already do, but but it's very hard to visibly demonstrate you do that other than telling people. So we're trying to create a visibility that starts to then become uh, resonate with the consumer. Uh, so the guides are really important. So for members, uh, there is a consumer guide that we expect them to display on their website, which starts to to help consumers better understand what good advice should look like. But but it is interesting because already we've had some of the uh, the other professional sectors, so uh, law and accountant uh, contact us to, uh, to to wonder if actually we could extend to them. And, and the answer is yes, but we've got to start by a focus on personal finance first. But of course, there is a natural interlink and overlap. And, and that was the whole idea of pension, uh, the pensions advice task force of being a cross sector. Um, it, it, it wasn't really at the time it got sort of tagged as personal finance society because i was uh, ceo of the pfs at the time and um it, it's and that's where it's unfortunate because it was set up as a uh, as a genuine cross sector task force by the the sector but it ended up getting tagged to one organization what we're doing with the alliance is trying to make sure that doing things like task force don't get tagged to the consumer duty alliance it's it, the alliance is where we start to abbreviate is that being it's part of the alliance but it's actually got its own ind individual identity to make the impact that we'd always intended uh, so in time uh, my ultimate vision will be in a few years time a significant number of consumer facing firms will be displaying the consumer duty alliance uh, badge OK, thanks for that, Keith. That's good. Uh, we'll come on to Simon Crystal in a minute, but I wanted to ask you that badge, therefore, is for emails, letterheads. Uh, if you sign up to it, that's that's a, um, your badge of honour, I guess, is 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 the way that's played out. Um, that's confirmed. Yes, Keith, that's yeah. It is, Steve. In, in fact, you'll see many IFA firms or many advice firms still use the uh, the badge that was created under the Pensions Advice Task Force, which was called the Gold Standard. Right. which okay. which we we did as consumer facing under the guidance of the government um three uh, um guidance services if you like tpas um mas and yep. pension wise okay okay i have another question but i'm going to pass on to simon crystal first because simon you're a practitioner and how is this helping you and you know in in the sort of ifa at the coal face i shouldn't really mention coal but anyway there we go uh how, how does it help you i i think for me, there, there are a couple of things here. Um, first of all, in financial services, there's always been, if you like, Keith talks about those 5,000 practitioners, a large, a significant number of those practitioners being under five people. And there's always been a focus both in regulation and, a, a, you know, in the fringes of good practice on that di direct to consumer um, element of practice. Pretty much since Pension Schemes Act 2015, there's a growing and very vibrant advice by the workplace sector. 
um, and its only current mention is in not too positive a way within the FCA's debat. Um, so I think it's important for uh, the Consumer Duty Alliance and what it's doing here and, and that to bring that via the workplace sector into the fold and to share good practice in terms of learning across those two sectors. Um, the second element is, is that that sharing and, and driving forward of standards. For me, I know it, Henry talked about the positive aspects of consumer duty. For me, the most positive aspect is the identification that somebody has to understand the decision that they make, which really drives a different form of communication for me. So I'm hopeful that the initiative that will be driven forward by Margaret and Keith will focus upon that key theme of consumer understanding, which actually deals with the vulnerability aspect and particularly value for money. Because I'm not certain at this stage that we we're as good at demonstrating how we can benefit consumers by working with them um, as we could be. And I'm very aware that years ago, you almost had the employer doing everything, putting lots of money in, taking all the risks. Uh, and you you ended up in a pretty good place as a as an individual, whereas now there's less money going in. There's people are expected to stand on their own two feet and building this platform to give them the help that they need where they need it, including those that wouldn't normally seek advice. I'm really hopeful that what Keith's driving here is going to be a big, big initiative for that. So well done, Keith, and thanks to Margaret for driving that for us. I think just if I can ex expand on that, I think it's a really valid point. The, the intentions we've always had with task force is not to create elitism. It's, it's actually how do we influence the behaviours of the whole market that aligns with the way that they think they operate as a firm. So in other words, you know, a, a good point here is that when you challenge regulators with how many people across the sector do you believe get up with the intent on doing the right thing? The answer actually often very quickly is the majority. Um, and, and it's really interesting because you establish that regulators don't find lots of evidence of individuals or firms deliberately doing the wrong thing. They just find lots of the wrong thing being done. Um, Sometimes that's suboptimal, sometimes that's one or two things out of all the things that firm might do extremely well. Uh, and I think there is an opportunity now that um, government clearly wants to see a change. There's interesting dialogue between regulators and government. Um, we are in a, an era where consumers are not making sufficient provisions um, to look after their future financial well-being, uh, and that's a role we need to play. Too many have become victims of financial fraud and scam to a scary level. Uh, and actually, it's the regulated markets that, that need to address the significant gap that, that's uh, the advice gap that's uh, around. But at the same time, we need governments and regulators to join forces. It's, it's interesting, we haven't got the parity of esteem that, for example, the medical profession has, yet there is lots of controversy around poor medical practice and, and poor outcomes, but it doesn't affect the way that we collectively, that they, the profession, the medical profession collectively falls together. Um, and that's a role that I think we need to, to think about very seriously as professionals, that we engender trust on an individual basis, but I'm not sure that we've quite worked out how to engender public trust in the, in the sector or the professions that we represent. And that's a key role that we want to to work with policymakers on. We've already had conversations along this line with government and FCA. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that there is a willingness uh, to better engage the markets. Um, we just need to, to try to create a bit of glue to join that up so that we can actually influence the right set of behaviours to ensure that we meet the expectations of, of government and regulators along the way. OK, great. Um, we'll come to Phil Hodges in a minute, but Henry, you just raised a hand. So, Henry, you go first. You're, you're on mute, Henry. <laughs> yeah, you managed to mute me. Hey, 
Um, yeah, great discussion so far. The, the key uh, to me is that in restoring public trust is that the, the advisory in, industry actually gets to the public. Um, at the moment, most of the public don't get advice and actually there's not a lot of advice out there to even employers. So um, I think Simon's point was that in the workplace, there are like 1 million plus employers who've taken decisions on workplace pensions. They by and large have done so unadvisedly. And we have this thing called a VFM framework now, which we're likely to get coming in as a result of DWP activity, which incidentally talks about the consumer duty throughout it. So I, I, one hope I have, and Margaret pointed this out, is that we get to a point where occupational pension trustees start seeing their duties as consumer duties, advisors seeing the duties uh, they have towards employers to ensure that good outcomes companies workplace pensions and we don't get stuck in this world where the only thing that people regard IFAs as doing is wealth management uh, and I think that's a real big problem that the public has is that IFAs are wealth managers not financial advisors um, so so I, I, I guess that's a long statement my question is really how how do we address that that issue and how does the consumer duty get spread out to a wider public from the IFA's client bank? Yeah, it's good. Uh, I mean, the debate, um, the FCA closed their consultation on um, what I guess in many ways was termed as trying to simplify the advice process to, to improve or uh, bridge the advice gap. Um, look, I mean, I think, I think there's far more advisors in the market who are willing to look at the accumulation stage, to get back into engaging consumers with their, their savings and the need for savings. Um, but, but you're right, uh, Henry, in the sense of people aren't walking around the streets looking for a financial advisor. So the reason that we've got a big advice gap is before pension freedoms, the regulator often denied that there was a, an advice gap. What they were denying is there is no advice demand gap. Uh, so there's a big difference between the need to do something uh, and actually the, 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 the action being taken by many people or the awareness to do something about it. So we've got to join up. For, for us, the, the real solution has to be an education programme that's three way, that's supported by government, regulators and the sector if we're really going to make an impact on engaging consumers in a more meaningful way. Some of that is going to be technology led. There's no question about it. Simplification um, does lend itself pretty well to technology. Advisors can play a big role, I think, in, in engaging people in a more meaningful way. And, and you know, you're right, hitherto, financial advisors have kind of allowed themselves to go into the advising people with accumulated wealth. But that's that's a largely driven by they're the people that are often likely to to want to seek advice. So the people who actually want to save for retirement, uh, start to to think about meeting goals and aspirations and how to achieve it. Unfortunately, they don't tend to think uh, to go and see a financial advisor. And they they might be surprised because I think yeah, you know when we look at fair value under consumer duty, it's going to be a big area of focus by the regulator. Um, uh, but I think actually the problem that we've had so far is that we haven't really had the joined up thinking. We've had pretty sporadic. Uh, so the answer through the uh, the the government's then initiated uh, financial advice market review, which unfortunately got scuppered by Brexit, um, was indeed to find ways to increase access to advice. And in fact, you, you'll remember the Minister's actual words at the time was she wanted hardworking people who want to do the right thing to have access to advice, whether that be straightforward, simplified or, or through regulated advisors. So I think there is a big opportunity. There's a willingness in government. Some of those people that have that kind of view uh, now have some influential roles. Uh, and I'm hoping that if we can join up in a way that makes sense, um, or shows some unity and provides offers solutions, then we might start to make some inroads into to addressing that that um, advice gap that's been growing. Did the Consumer Duty Alliance actually submit anything to that with regard to the VFM consultation? No, we did. We, uh, so we did, were involved, uh, but we didn't submit because at the time we were still under the FVT and we had decided that 
uh, we would leave it to um, the trade associates. So we input to some other organisations rather than did it ourselves. In future, so we are re-engaging, in fact, um, um, well, there's no breaching confidentialities, but I'm going back in to see the, the FCA um, to, to discuss the findings so far and, and how we might be able to assist to come up with solutions. Okay, fantastic, Keith, thank you. Uh, Phil, you've had your hand raised for a while. Do you want to ask your question, make your point? Yeah, hi, hi, Keith. Um, what What's your thoughts about a, a assurance uh, against standards? So, um, if you take the, uh, the the pension transfer gold standard as an example, is that that that's largely people writing in and saying just like, "Yep, we do all these things." And what, what what's your thoughts about within Consumer Duty Alliance how you're actually going to actually give assurance to the compliance with with standards? Yeah, it's a good question. It, I mean, it came up originally, uh, you'll be, you won't be surprised in the, the task force. What we decided is that we didn't want to create either elitism, in other words, a set of standards that were so difficult, only a few could, could achieve them. Um, and equally, we didn't want to create uh, another layer of, of regulation. We didn't want to become a pseudo regulator by policing standards. What we decided was that we needed to create a code um, for people to adopt. We need to create visibility so that consumers can see and reference. Um, and our whole aim is to influence behaviours before the advice is given. So, so what we're really trying to do through the sharing of good practice is to try to improve outcomes through a much broader sharing of good practice. Now, ultimately, as a, the membership grows, uh, of course, we have got it linked in that we may do random sampling uh, and testing against professional standards. But it's a really tough, tough one, Phil, because once you start setting yourself up as a tester, uh, when all, all of a sudden you've got a very active regulator in the market with, you know, four, that employs four and a half thousand staff, um, you, you're kind of duplicating the work, but it's always after the event. So, you know, what we really want to do is demonstrate how collectively, so we'll never stop poor outcomes happening. It's just the degree of poor outcomes uh, that we want to stop happening. So we want to, if you're going to improve standards, you've got to be prepared to share it with the wider market. And there's always a risk that some of your adopters may not be meeting the standards that they're signing up to say they're going to do, but they would have been doing it anyway. So I think that actually for us, if it answers the question, it's a tough one. We didn't want barriers in the way. We want to genuinely have more and more people who believe they're doing the right thing to be influenced by the fact that they're now actually part of an alliance where they're prepared to think a bit broader, test their own thinking, look at good practice across the market, and hopefully that in turn starts to influence behaviours. OK, Keith, thanks for that answer. Really good. Um, Margaret, you've got your hand up and then we'll come back to Simon, if possible. Thanks. Um, I just just wanted to mention on the pensions advice task force that um, one of the outputs was a member leaflet, which was in, really it was there to help members recognise a good um, advisor. Um, so it was along the lines of does your advisor do these things? Um, yes, he's a good advisor. You know, does he fail to do this? He's a bad advisor. And I know it's um, sort of putting the onus on, you know, people to choose, but really that's kind of where we are. But um, it did actually act as a as a sort of break or a, a policing, um, you know, because we asked people who signed up to the gold standard to issue that leaflet to customers. So, so I think it was it was the best way we could do it at the time but you know things have moved on and i'm quite sure we'll be able to you know have more metrics but as, as keith said you know we're not here to do a regulator's job we're here to try and stop harm being done it's it's too late um once it's been done yeah and i'll just add to that um steve that um it, it's uh, that did start to work extremely well because consumers often feel vulnerable because they're not often empowered enough or they don't have enough 
knowledge to test someone that clearly has more knowledge than them. So if you if you think about the basics, every consumer technically uh, their common vulnerability is that they know less than you do. And that's something that we have to respect when we're dealing with people in vulnerable circumstances. They might be perfectly capable of making informed decisions, but often they're not empowered enough to have enough knowledge to challenge whether or not what you've told them is right or wrong. So part of the guides that we, we give to consumers is starting, it was aimed to empower them to ask questions. And if you're not sure, don't go ahead. Um, if you're unsure, get the advisor to re-explain it to you. They won't be offended because every professional advisor should, should be mortified if you, you don't feel fully empowered. Um, and take your time. If you're still unsure, step away. And even if you take advice from a, a you know close friend or a member of the family, it's wise to, to, to step out. So I think we've got to give consumers that the, empower them to be in more control if they don't feel comfortable with doing things. And that's part of the problem we found even with some of the consumer groups that we engaged around some of the barriers. Often the barrier is, um, it's interesting, one of our, uh, the, in fact, she was the chair of the FCA's consumer uh, um, committee. And, um, yeah, you know, I remember once I asked him in front of a load of other consumer representatives about uh, what are the barriers. Now, one of the interesting ones was someone in the group said, um, well, why don't advisors offer, you know, some their advice free for the first, you know, for the initial chat? And of course, an advisor in the group said, well, actually, we do. We, we offer our, you know, the first consultation at no expense. Um, now, this particular lady, who some of you probably worked out who she is, uh, just said, oh, dear, please, that's just that's just entrapment. Uh, now, to which everyone else sort of felt a bit shocked. And uh, but actually, I, I, I you know, I, I chose not to react because when you're asking consumer groups for genuine input on on what are the barriers and what do we need to do to address those barriers, what you start to realise is perception is people's reality. So as as, a, as an industry, as a sector, sometimes we've ignored addressing perception because it's not reality. It's not true. So we don't do that. So we don't address. But perception is people's reality. So if people think that we're we're not there to act in their best interest, then as far as they're concerned, we're not there to act in their best interest. So when I reflected, I had realised that actually even going to an advisor where the first the initial consultation is free or at the advisor's expense, however they wanted to position it, actually it does feel a bit, if you're not sure what the end is going to be, it can feel a bit like entrapment. Because once you've once you've tasted that free sample, do you feel obliged to have to go on? So there are interesting things, dynamics that I think we can learn, uh, which, and again, we're setting up a consumer group, so that we can learn from some of the basic language that we've become over familiar with or approaches because it's what we do, but actually it, it's completely alien or counterintuitive to a consumer. So where we think it's, it's you know, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I'll give you a good example, a lady very quickly, a lady in, in, in Northern Ireland uh, I was talking to once, she'd just become chartered, she had no clients, and she was asking me how best to go about it. And I said, give people certainty of, of what it is you can do and how much you'll charge. And she said, what do you mean? And I said, well, like, Big booking in your car, how confident would you be booking it in for a service if you didn't know what the ultimate cost was going to be? So you know if there's additional things to be done, there might be additional costs. Anyway, she put a, an advert in the Belfast local uh, qualified charter financial planner offering a retirement options review. Uh, the cost was, I think she had said it at £150 um, and uh, basically included a one hour meeting and a, a replaying of the options available. Anyway. She was flooded with inquiries from people, in some instances, that were multimillionaires. And the interesting thing is we came to the conclusion it was that, and many of them wanted to buy her services after that, that initial consultation, but she was very deliberate on making, making a break. The conclusion we came to is that people had greater certainty of how much they were in for. They knew what they were going to get and how much it was going yeah. to cost. And if they wanted to go on, that was their choice.
but they didn't feel entrapped. Yeah. So I took I took some of the the guidance from the consumer group, um, and actually tried to apply it in certain circumstances, and actually it it, it works. So things like that we've got to to learn from, uh, and perhaps work out how we can engage more consumers in a way that provides them with the confidence uh, that we're not there just to try to make as much money out of them as possible. Yeah, that's a great example and should form the core of your, you know, research, I think, you know, is perception. We've had a number of playpen events where we're talking about the advice gap and I think it's perception of of advisors and advice and, you know, oh my God, it's going to cost me three grand, five grand and I don't know where to stop or start or whatever. It's um, a very, very important um, point to, uh, to to focus on, definitely. Um, because it's not just, you know, uh, the Gen Zs, you know, it's the parents of the Gen Zs and the parents of the parents of the Gen Zs. Um, you know, some of us on this call will remember the 80s and the 90s. And um, I think the perception needs to change. The perception needs to change of the advisor community. Absolutely correct. So that's really good. Um, Simon, can I come to you, Simon? Sorry, Keith, go on. No, no, I was going to say, it's, I mean, people do trust their advisor, but, but they don't necessarily trust the, se the sector that the advisor operates in and that's something that we have to address. Um, people work very hard at, at trying to build confidence and trust in the services they provide but they don't necessarily work as as hard at trying to engender trust in the sector that they represent and that's something that we've got to try to to address collectively rather than just purely ploughing on on an indi individual basis. Yeah okay so Simon Crystal you had your hand up for a while uh, what are you as a firm? What are you as a firm doing in that particular space? I mean, uh, do do you have a set model that doesn't entrap uh, potential clients, or how, how does it work with you? Well, there's two things. The first reason I had my hand up is Keith covered a lot of it off, and as as an industry, um, it's too easy for regulators to judge advisors and advisors to judge advisors. Um, consumer duties about informed decisions, and when we spoke to the FCA about this, we almost said to them, okay. If the records demonstrate that the individual, um, it was truly tailored, you talk to them in a way that they understand and that they made a decision that they understand. What's your role in assessing files then? And, and their answer was, we're not quite sure, um, but I guess it will be around how you demonstrate an informed choice. I think that's the first, you know, to add on you know, to the theme that Keith was covering. And I think, Henry, you mentioned it earlier, and I think hopefully the task force finds a way to engage directly with consumers because the true test of whether or not people make informed decisions can only come from consumers it can't come from regulators it can't come from an intermediary body it has to come from consumers uh, steve from our model it is via the workplace um there is some element of direct to consumer but it's very small and it's a priced model it's this is what it costs and this is what you get it's pounds and pence um every step of the way what i would point out is, is You've got to get a good mix. Some of our learning is that, for example, more recently with the cost of living crisis, it's it's really important for people to know they can speak to us. And if they want to speak to us and the first thing we do is say you need to write a check, it almost puts them off. It, it stops that from being something that they can easily do. So we we're looking at a mix which almost says, you know what? we you can speak to us without it writing a check and we can do it this way in some years we win some years you win and we'll make it easier for you but there are two barriers in my mind this perception that you talked about trust and cost and whatever we do has to address those two barriers and the reason for advice via the workplace and the reason why i believe this will continue to be a growing sector is employers have to pay a part play a part in that in valuing their people and this group pension playpen uh, you know and the people that it has in here and the influence that those people carry would be massively helpful to to carry that message um because if we leave these individuals to to their own devices they're coming out in trouble and that's already starting to be the case this isn't something for 5 10 15 20 years ahead our data shows that that's happening right now so we've got you know hopefully this group that Margaret is chairing and Keith is driving is able to be impactful and impactful early, early in delivering the messages across the industry. I certainly hope so. Well, Simon, I, I, you know, just following on from the idea, I mean, you know, it sounds like try before you buy could be a fantastic starting point 
where a number of advisors um, would join up and say, we're prepared to offer X amount of time for £100, £150, whatever it is, a try before you buy. Because I think as Keith said on that example, the big gap between trust and the advisor, especially for a new advisor and a new client, um, is massive. Um, you've got to gain confidence and trust. So try before you buy is a great concept, I think, if that's possible. Where, but advisors have got to say, across the board, it's got to be a pretty much a flat rate that we're prepared to give an advisor level four or level six for an hour at that rate. So it doesn't matter whether you're in Newcastle, Exeter, Maidstone or wherever you are, try before you buy is a set rate for a set hour and the, the client knows they're not on the hook for thousands and thousands. So it's got to be some sort of um, opportunity there, Keith, I think, as, as part of your consumer, you know, um, uh, design, I guess, you know, I, I think it's really good. Um, do you agree with that, Keith? I mean, is that a, is that a concept, an idea or? Yeah, no, def definitely, Steve. I think uh, the challenges we've had when we came up to RDR, you, you know, just taking people back, th there was the, th there was the belief that over 60% of the market would disappear because consumers wouldn't be prepared to to pay a fee for advice. So what advisors had to work very hard on positioning the value of the service they provided and give complete transparency over the, the cost of the, the fees that they charge. So, but we've got to unravel a bit of that. So a lot of hard work went into actually becoming a fee charging advisor and being very clear and transparent and the regulator arguably would want even greater transparency because it's it's difficult for consumers to compete um, but at the same time that has put many consumers off because it's made advice sound extremely expensive uh, and only for those that are uber wealthy so again we've got to create a bit of education over 80 percent of new clients generally come to existing advisors through word of mouth through recommendations. They don't come from people off the high street. Um, they usually come from someone that knows someone that's experiencing advice. And this is the interesting thing. The IFA sector and or the small intermediary sector is so resilient because the vast majority of their clients are sticky. Once you've experienced professional advice and the value, the confidence and the trust that that, that, that engenders, you can quantify value actually price no longer becomes a key driver. If you've never experienced it, one of the key questions you're going to ask a firm is how much do you charge? Because the only thing I can differentiate now is cost, because uh, I don't know what value looks like. So I think that's the bit that we, we got to tackle as well. We, you know, there's a number of things that we need to do to help bridge the gap. But, but you know, overarching all of this, everyone benefits. If we can raise the profile of the value of the professional services that are provided, across our market, then ultimately more and more consumers are going to engage. So when we look at good consumer outcomes, yep. there are too many that that are doing nothing. And worse than that, they're wandering in to, to the minefields of scammers and, and fraudsters. So, you know, there's a lot more that's got to be done. We, we focus on the consumers that are already engaged. We've absolutely got to spend more time on, on those consumers that are unengaged uh, and unprotected if we really do mean uh, and the regulator is serious about consumer duty. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, Phil, you got your hand raised, or Henry, I saw your hand raised. We're sort of getting close to the end now, but uh, Phil, did you have another question? Oh, or we got no, Tim. No, no, no that <laughs> okay. Was... okay, Tim, do you want to go? You just raised a hand. Yeah, morning all. Um, just a couple of observations on the try before you buy. It's a great idea, but most of the time, people who buy into try before you buy have got a degree of confidence in what it is they're thinking about, that they understand the area that they want to go into. And I think this is there's more to do with confidence building amongst um, retail clients before that try before you buy will actually gain traction. And I think that's again where the where the alliance can actually generate some significant benefit uh, because it's going to get a general message out there, not a particular message. A try before you buy is a particular message. We need to create the environment where that try before you buy is an acceptable way of, of moving forward from an individual's point of view. That's part one. Part two, um, Keith, a question for you. Um, Consumer duty is very much an FCA focused piece of, of activity, looking at retail uh, clients. 
I, I'm really intrigued to know the extent to which you think the Alliance will engage with TPR to, to assist trustees to develop their thinking beyond the, um, the provision of member benefits, but to actually think about client outcomes, retail client outcomes, member outcomes. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Uh, we've already reached out to, to TPR, um, who are keen to, to engage. Um, you, you won't be surprised to learn. But um, I think just to make the point, for, for me, one of the, the core drivers for consumer duty is it lives way beyond the current set of regulatory rules. In, in other words, this is a, equally an opportunity for the industry to take back control of driving standards because, you know, every firm I've worked for, I mean, I've been head of retail, I've, you know, run a big uh, intermediary network and support service group uh, and run, led a, a professional body. In my commercial world, I've got to tell you that, you know, I passionately believe I work for good firms who absolutely put the customer at the heart of everything that they did. But that isn't the perception of regulators uh, or the public. Now, we had great, in, in the consumer facing world, we had great uh, uh, testimonials from clients and we had trust with those that we had a relationship with. But it's a bit like banks. Most people trust their bank, but they don't trust bankers. So it's an interesting, it's interesting dilemma, isn't it? Think about it. When you've been with a bank for 25 years, you know, you pretty much trust your bank. But when you ask the question, do you trust bankers? The answer is no. So there's a massive cultural fix that that has got to, to go down. So for me, actually, a lot of it is is perception is is a massive part of the problem. Conflicts of interest aren't often managed effectively, and that sometimes is where there's a real conflict with regulatory expectations or consumer expectations. So it's not a deliberate intent to do the wrong thing, but it may not be a conscious decision to put the consumer first. And that's where consumer duty is interesting because the regulator is expecting firms to regularly test whether or not they're putting the interest of their customer first or the interest of their firm at first. So it's it's so we have a role to play, I think, in getting our getting ourselves together and thinking about the way in which we can now take back control of driving the agenda supported by regulators rather than the other way around having to comply with what we're told. Yep. Okay. Fantastic, Keith. Uh, I think that's been a fantastic presentation. Um, big clap of hands um, for you, Keith. That was absolutely fantastic. And uh, we wish you much success with it. I'm sure if anybody wants to join, sign up. Billy, today's the day um, to sign up to, uh, to, to, to the um uh, alliance and that'd be absolutely fantastic and uh you know as an industry we need to move forward and keith you know initiatives like this really really help everybody you know the perception of our industry whether it's pensions investments advice whatever we need people like you and alliances uh, like you to help that uh, that message uh, because i think there's been a lot of damage done i mentioned the 80s and the 90s but through those times there's also a lot of damage done and there's a long long way to go so, you know, Keith, really, really appreciate your input and your time. Fantastic could, presentation. Could I, Sorry, I Henry, you had a question. question. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, sure. You, you mentioned Simon as a practitioner. I mean, there are quite a few people on this call who are also, you know, registered with the reg as, as SSCA people. Yeah. Is this exclusive to IFAs, advisors, or, or can people like me register my firms? And I, I, I say this with tongue in cheek, but my next meetings with a restricted advisor with over 5,000 advisors who are very interested in the conversation we're having today, specifically about the workplace and how they how they interact with that. Would there be space for a large restricted advisor too, or are you exclusive to IFAs? Uh, we're, we're open to everyone, Henry. I mean, from an advice point of view, we've focused on the personal, uh, the personal finance sector, and that's anyone within that sector. But frankly, it's anyone related across retail financial services. So as I say, we've already got insurance companies that have now signed up as affiliates and members. Um, so it's absolutely open to you. It's open to everyone on this call, both as individuals and as firms. So please, if you yeah. sign up as a, a firm, don't forget to register as an individual as well. Um, you do get the badge that you can uh, obviously promote as part of that alliance, but it is ultimately open to everyone. 
So you're not an IFA trade body. That's, I think, the confusion that a lot of people will have because of your history. You are actually uh, representing the industry with regards to consumer duty, yeah? Absolutely. Listen, I cut my teeth in insurance, and um, so I'm I'm passionate about joining everything together rather than be, you know creating elite elite groups that actually just serve to to create fragmentation. I, I like the idea of individuality. I like competition. I think there should be there is no one size fits all. But I think as an alliance, we need to respect uh, that diversity. And make sure that we are an inclusive body and that's exactly what we set out to be okay. great okay fantastic keith fantastic presentation thank you very much uh next week we have um rosalind connor from arc law talking about strange things with a with a lifetime allowance so uh if you think you know everything you do about lifetime allowance think again um, because of the change, uh, recent change in the budget. Uh, she's got some very interesting things to analyze. So join us next week for uh, Rosalind Connor. Uh, and as we usually say, uh, let's pray for peace in the East, um, which, you know, my God, I can't believe it's uh, April. Um, and uh, let's pray for peace in the East. Uh, hope you enjoyed today's session. I wish you everybody uh, uh, a very uh, safe and um, onward journey today in whatever you're doing. And um, we look forward to uh, seeing you all next week. Um, uh, thank you much indeed for everybody's time and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks very much indeed. Cheers, Keith. Thanks a lot. Bye.